every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with what accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. scripture lesson will be taken from the book of St. Matthew, Matthew Gospel, chapter 22, reading from the 23rd verse unto the 33rd verse. Matthew chapter 22. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and ask him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. 
Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do her, not knowing the scripture, nor the power of God. For in the, in the resurrection they are neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angel, angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. May God have mercy upon us this morning. Amen. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it firmly stands, even though the earth will tumble. And the hills tumble and the earth crumbles and our life seems to be crumbling. But we thank you that we have a rock that we can stand on. And we thank you that we have a God who cares. And now as we hold your word in your, our hands, please make it come alive as we share today for Christ's sake. Amen. A young man had just graduated from Bible college and was now anxious to use some of the theological terms that he had learned in Bible school. And he had just gotten hired by a country church and, uh, and now he decided he'd go into the neighborhood to see if he could win his first convert for Christ. So while he was there, he ran into a, a farmer who was busily uh, working in his field. And, and since he wasn't sure if this man uh, was a Christian, he, he went to the farmer and he said, uh, Sir, are you laboring in the Lord's vineyard? Uh, the farmer uh, didn't even look up. He, says, he said, No, this is not a vineyard. These are soybeans, not grapes. <laughs> well, he, he realized the man didn't understand him. So he said, Let me ask you another question. Are you a Christian? The farmer said, no, 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 my name is Jones. You must be looking for Jim Christian down the road. <laughs> well, on dawn to the young, the young preacher said, are you lost? The man says, no, sir, I've been living here for 27 years. <laughs> well, he, he, he said, are you prepared for the resurrection? Well, he finally got the, the man's attention, and, and so the, the farmer stopped working for a minute, and he said, he said, when is it going to be? The young preacher smiled, he got him there, and he said, it, he said, it could be today, it could be tomorrow, or it could be the next day. The farmer wiped his brow, and he, and he, and he came to the man, and he said softly, he says, please don't tell my wife. He says, I'm very busy right now with the harvest. And if my wife finds out about it, she doesn't get out much. And she may tell me we have to go all three days. <laughs> you didn't get that one. <laughs> she didn't understand about the resurrection. This morning I'm speaking on the theme, key facts about the resurrection. Key facts about our resurrection. In last week's message, remember we spoke about the, the Pharisees and the Herodians and how they united in a trap, to, in, their, in their plan to trap Jesus. And the Bible tells us that that very same day, another group came to Jesus. You had the Pharisees, the Herodians, and that same day another group came, a group called the Sadducees. So we have the Pharisees, we got the Sadducees, we got the Herodians, and all of them are coming to Jesus to try and trap him. Now the Sadducees were a very interesting group because they only believed in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. The Sadducees only believed in the books of Moses. Now although the, the resurrection was actually mentioned in the five books of Moses, none of the books gave 
any details or clear explanation of what this resurrection was all about. And so the Sadducees rejected a bodily resurrection. Isn't therefore strange that as, as you, you heard the passage read, isn't it strange that this group who does not believe in the resurrection, they're coming to Jesus with a question about the resurrection. You know, sometimes in church people come and they ask questions, but they're not really trying to get an answer. Yeah. And that's exactly what you have here. The, Phari the Sadducees are coming to Jesus with a question, but they're not really trying to get an answer. They, they, they're really trying to ridicule the idea of a resurrection. And so they, they, they come to Jesus with a scenario that is sort of amazing. So here's the story. You see it in your Bible. It says a man died without kids. Uh, so his widow married his brother to raise up offspring for the deceased. Now, now you may say, wait a minute. Where did that idea come from? Whose idea was that? Well, do you know in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 to 10, I think it's on the board, the scriptures say to us, if brothers are living together and one of them dies... Without, is, there, is, that, is that up on the screen? If brothers are living together, Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 5, and one of them dies without a son, and if it's not there, turn in your Bible, Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10. Turn there in your Bibles, please. Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 5 to 10. Turn in your Bible. You got it? Amen. All right, here we go. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So you understand the purpose. You, you, you died without any children, sir. Your, 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 your wife marries your brother. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife... She shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, My husband's brother refuses to carry out on his brother's name in Israel. He will not, not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of the elders, take off his sandals, the what? spit in his face and say this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line that man's line shall be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled well well you see the light no, guys please don't worry if your brother died without children you, do, you don't have to marry his wife. Okay, guys? You're off the hook. In fact, if you did it, some of us would wonder, what in the world is going on? <laughs> it doesn't look kosher. Am I right about it? All right? But, but this was done in the Old Testament here, and this was given to ensure the lineage of the deceased brother was continued. But back to our story. Things got worse. The second brother died without any children. So she married the third brother. Good thing he had three. But he died with no children. Well, he had a fourth brother. So she married him. Now, if I were the fifth brother, I'd be scared of this woman. <laughs> have to join the ranks of the unsandaled. <laughs> the fifth brother is scared, but he marries her. No children. The sixth brother. Oh, what a good thing. This man had so many children. So many brothers. 
the seventh marries no children. Now I wonder if, are, 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 you, are you like me and wondering if this woman has a medical problem? Am, am I the only one wondering if this woman has some medical problem? But here's their question. They come to Jesus and they pose this amazing case and they said, so let me ask you Jesus, whose wife she, will she be after the resurrection? Come on now Jesus. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're chuckling inside. They're, they're really chuckling. Jesus, according to what you have said, all these seven men will now have a new body looking for a wife. <laughs> Whose wife will she be, Jesus? You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection and, and they were making mockery of it. Sadly, some of us who believe in resurrection underestimate how important this teaching is. I was, uh, I was speaking to a lady many, many years ago. She is no longer in her church. But she came to me and she said, you know, what I don't like is sometimes we, you guys talk about things that are going to happen in the future. Talk about heaven and resurrection. She says, we need to talk about practical stuff. We need to talk about this stuff right now. How to deal with our current drama. That's what we need to talk about. We don't need to be talking about things in the future. You see, she missed how important the resurrection is to our daily living. And my friend, it could be that you're one of those who, you know, some people talk about uh, Christianity. Christians only look for pie in the sky. Well, I'm not looking for pie. I'm looking for something much better than pie. Amen? Amen? But I want you to realize that if there is no resurrection, we may as well shut the church door because Christianity would be a dead end street. Without the teaching of resurrection, we may as well shut the door. In 1972, Andre Crouch came out with a song, and I loved the song. And it said, if heaven never was promised to me, neither God's promise to live eternally, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Living in a world of darkness, you came along and brought me the light. You, you see, so I used to, it was a nice, if heaven never was promised to me. Oh, probably, one day you and I can sing. <laughs> That's my wife I'm looking at. But I, <laughs> he says, it doesn't matter if heaven wasn't promised to me. He says, just having God in our life is good enough for him. Well, I want to tell you, having Jesus and God in my life has made a world of difference. But I want to tell you, that's not enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19 says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Listen, if you were living, if you are a Christian looking forward to heaven and it turns out there was no heaven, Christianity would be the biggest hoax. Jesus Christ would be the biggest liar. But thank God, Jesus Christ is not a liar. 1 Corinthians 15, 32, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Listen, if there is not going to be a heaven, if there is no consequence, if there is no life beyond the grave, there is no point living for Jesus. Just do what you want to do. Live it up. But thank God there is resurrection. And there ought to, listen, this resurrection... Young person, listen to me good. Because sometimes young people don't want to think about heaven. They figure when you get old, you'll start thinking about heaven. We need to all be thinking about heaven right now. Because when we live our lives recognizing the reality of heaven, it impacts how we live now. 
First John chapter 3 verse 2 and 3 says, Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we like will be like uh, has not yet been, been made known. But listen, but it says, but we know, we know, what do we know? We know that when Christ appears, what? We shall be like him. We what? We, we know. Do you really know? I know that when Christ appears, I am going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And listen, here it does end there. And then it says, if all who have this hope in him, what does it do? It purifies them. When you have this hope of us, the, the resurrection, the hope of heaven, when this is in you, it purifies you. It makes you, it makes you live a different way. Now with this backdrop, I want to answer four questions about the resurrection. Question number one, will we be able to recognize our loved ones after the resurrection? Have you ever wondered about that? You know, we as Christians walk around and they talk about, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see my father and my mother at funerals, everybody. We're going to see mama and dada. We're going to see this one and that one. Are we really? Is the resurrection body similar to a present body? Will a double amputee, an ugly 92-year-old man who was a double amputee, will he look the same in the resurrection? Will a person who was badly disfigured in fire look the same? You see, the Sadducees are assumed the resurrection body Jesus was talking about was similar to what we have now. As far as they were concerned, the resurrection body is the same thing with the ever ready battery. You understand, the ever ready battery. Or what is the one that lasts longer? The, the energizer bunny. Just keeps on going, keeps on going, keeps. Well, well, is that for real? Turn in your Bibles. This, this morning you went to a little bit more Bible study than you normally do. So, um, but this word of God is sure. We better see what it says. Amen. So hold your no, your Bible, your finger right where you are, and turn in your Bible to First Corinthians chapter fifteen. First Corinthians chapter fifteen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to read from verse 35 to verse 38 of that chapter. Uh, first thir th verse 35 to 38. And it says there, But someone may ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. In other words, you cannot have a resurrection unless you die. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of someone, something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. The first thing I want us to notice here is that the resurrected body will be totally different from our present body. Don't miss verse 37. Verse 37 says, when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just what? A seed. You see, the, 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 our present body is like a seed that is being planted. And the resurrected body is going to be totally different. Now, some of you have done some planting. And so I, I did a couple of things myself and uh, under guidance of my beloved. But uh, let's say you have, if, if you planted a mango seed. Now, does the fruit, or let's say it was an orange or whatever, does that orange seed look like an orange? So, so we, 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 where, do, where are we running around with this idea that this resurrected body is just the same 
thing with some fixing up, some patching up, some a new energizer bunny. God says, this is like a seed. And he says, what you sow, you don't plant what will be. Chew on that one for a little bit. So what we do know is that crippled and burned body will not look like that in the resurrection. Amen. Amen. And for most of us, that's good news. Now, if you think you're all that, you might feel so good to know this is going to be a dramatic change. But there are going to be no deformed, no sickly folk in heaven, no aged folk in heaven. We're going, none of us are going to grow old in heaven. Amen? Amen? But second, the resurrected body is a spiritual body. And I'm going to come back to say some more. The resurrected body is a spiritual body. Verse number 42, same passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised what? A spiritual body. The resurrected body will not, is not only a different body, but secondly, the resurrected body is a spiritual body, not a spirit, not a ghost, not a duppy. I threw that in for the islanders. Not a ghost, not a whatever you want to call it. It's a spiritual body. It has flesh and bones. You say, how do I know that? Because Jesus, when he came, when he was resurrected, he said, a spirit has not flesh and bones like you see me have. It will be a body with flesh. It's a body with bones. It doesn't mean flesh. And it's not going to be flesh like you cut me and I bleed, all right? Or you can gouge out a piece of my flesh. But there's going to be physical, physical form. It's going to be a body with physical form. It's going to be a body with bones, whatever that might be. But it's not going to be a body with blood. But number three, the resurrected body is a body like what Jesus had. We just read first John chapter 3 verse number 2 where we saw that the Lord told us that we shall be like him for we shall see him as it is. It's a real body. It's a body. <laughs> you know, so the school class this morning, the question was asked, the teacher asked the, 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 the members, so when you get to heaven, uh, and I'm not picking on anybody, <laughs> but it, I thought it was a good answer. The question was, when you get to heaven, what are you looking forward to doing? And everybody said, but I love this answer, because somebody says, I am looking forward to food. <laughs> And I added to that, and I can, you can eat as much as you want with no calories to worry about. But, but, but it's a body that enjoys food. Do you know that the Bible said that Jesus, you remember when he came back, he was eating some? He was eating some good fish. But it's a strange type of body, because it's a body that can walk through walls. No... You're saying, how can a body with bone go through the wall? Well, in our class this morning, we began to realize that heaven and this body is off the hook. It's, it's a different dimension. It, 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 it's, it's, we are not fully, listen, you see the problem is, we are still thinking of the resurrected body as earth part two. We're thinking of heaven as earth part two. But heaven is not earth part two. Heaven is a totally new deal. Beyond your, the pale of your imagination. And these bodies are going to be off the hook. Because where God is taking us is to a place that is off the hook. So, so let, let's make sure we're understanding this. Now, you're saying, Brother Brian, you're still skirting around the question because you haven't answered. Will I be able to see and recognize my mama or not? 
I know that's what you want me to talk about. Will I know my husband? Will I know my wife? Come on, answer the question. Oh, I'm not running from it, so let me answer the question. We will be able to recognize each other. And I say this for two reasons. Number one, even though a person's transformed body will be dramatically different, the perfected faculties providing in our new bodies will give us the ability to know stuff that presently is beyond our pay grade. Never forget, these new bodies come with faculties that are beyond your imagination. In fact, uh, speaking on another subject, but it still is helpful to, to grab a hold of this scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, it actually says, Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Then I shall know fully. There is a day coming when we will know fully. By the way, not everyone's appearance will be dramatically different. And I say, uh, Jesus uh, was recognizable. Is that true? Jesus was recognizable after his resurrection. Now it is clear that it was not easily recognizable because it's obvious that a number of people did not recognize him. But it's obvious that some did. So, so there, is, there is some degree that we may, 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 may come to the conclusion that it's possible that although everything is totally different, some people may be, the transformation may not be that dramatic that no one can recognize you if it were here on earth. But the reality, my point is, in heaven, hey, you're going, to have, you're going to have a brain that is a little bit different from what you, let, let me not say a little. It's a different, a brain that can, I don't even know if you're going to call it a brain. But obviously the soul that we have still is inhabiting this new body. And thank God we will be able to recognize each other. But here's the second reason though. There's a second reason why I believe that we'll be able to recognize each other. And turn with me to Luke's Gospel chapter 16. Luke's Gospel chapter 16. And you may not have looked at this passage like this before. Uh, so some of you may disagree with me, but that's okay. Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 19 to 24. Luke 16, verse 19 to 24. Uh, there was a rich man. Anybody knows this part story? There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked this uh, poor man's sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, here's this. In Hades, or in hell, as your Bible may translate it, in Hades, uh, where he was in torment, because remember now, this is a temporary, this, when it's evil, though your Bible may say hell, it's not talking about the, the lake of fire, because that doesn't come until way at the end of the story. This is a temporary holding spot that Jesus is describing. Jesus is peeling away the curtain, and he's giving us a peek at something that's going on. This is a real story here. This is not a parable. And Jesus peeks, pulls away the curtain, and he says, in Hades, where this man was in torment, he looked up, and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side so he called to him Father Abraham have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire we don't have the time to develop all of this but suffice it to say that prior to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ the, both, the, both the, the, the righteous and the unrighteous were in one area where there was a gulf fixed between the two and you could see from one side to the other but after the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead he led captivity captive and all those who are in Christ those who love the Lord Jesus everyone who is saved when we die today and we'll get there in a minute but, but I'm ahead of myself when we die now we don't go to Abraham's bosom But this was before Christ died and was resurrected. This is what happened then. But we'll, you'll see in a moment that that's not what's going to happen. When we die as believers in Jesus Christ, we do not go to Abraham's bosom. But here's the point I'm trying to get across. Here is my point. 
Jesus is showing you that this man, and hey, here's a mistake some of us make. Some of us make the mistake of believing they had a body. Why do you think they had a body? Because it says, get him to tip his finger. That's a part of your body, right? And take his finger and to put on my... And that's a part of your body. So they must have had a body. Come on, Bible students. How could they have had a body? The resurrection had not yet come. We're going to see in a moment when resurrection day is. Jesus is telling you a story before resurrection day comes and he is talking about tongue, he's talking about fingers and he said, hold a minute brother Brian, hold, break it down. Well, what, what did we talk about last week? Last week we spoke about the soul. And what did we say about the soul? If you remember, last week we learned that the soul is where our personality is, our memory, everything has so much is, is lodged in our soul. <coughs> One of the brothers last week, he, 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 I didn't ask permission, so I'll just tell the story without calling his, names, his name, but he didn't even know I was going to be preaching on this. And so he shared a story with me last week that was so irrelevant. He told me, he said, you know, Brother Brian, um, my mother-in-law was, was amputated. Her legs were amputated. And he said, she, she fell, she was using the bathroom, and she fell. Uh, and, and guess why she fell? Because she thought she had legs. She thought she had legs. And so she was trying to get up as if she had legs. Because you see, my friend, even though these body parts are cut off, the soul still remembers and acts as if you still have these body parts. And so the, what is being described here for us is a man that has no body, but he, he feels like a man that has a body that is in fire, and he's begging for somebody to come and just take a tip of water and touch his tongue. I want to talk to those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to recognize, my friend. Listen, young person. My biggest concern is to know that there are young people, that there might be young people in this church who come Sunday after Sunday and have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. My young friend, if you're young or old, make sure today you come to know Jesus. Because this man is saying that even prior to the final judgment, God is, the Lord Jesus is helping us to realize that the man is in incredible torment and he's in so much torment, he's feeling like a person who just wishes he could get even one drop of water, just a little drop of water. The, 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 the torment was so intense. Tormented, uh, torment of the soul. But my friend, here's the sad part for this person, for this, for this rich man who is here in Hades, in torment. The Bible lets us to know that he's going to be resurrected one day. One day he's also going to get a body and it's going to be double trouble, double jeopardy. He's not only going to be in torment of his soul, he's going to be put in the lake of fire, into a fire that the Bible says the, the worms do not die and the fire is not quenched. He's going to be given a body. Oh my goodness. Are you, are you understanding what God is saying? This, this, this word of God which stands this is a sure foundation and this word of God is telling you that one day this man is going to be resurrected. He's going to be getting a body. A body that can never die. And a body that will be able to feel the intensity of the fire of God for eternity. What, a, what, what, a, what? Oh, I, I pray today. You make Jesus your savior today. Don't wait another day. Don't even wait till the message is finished in your heart. Just open it and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Save me by your grace. Forgive me my sin and come into my heart. But here's the point I want to make as we deal with the, the particular issue uh, here in front of us. Because what we're finding out is that there is a level of communication at the level of the soul. 
Do you realize that's what that passage is saying to us? This passage is saying that there is a level of communication and enough recognition at the level of the soul because here this man is in Hades without a body and he's able to recognize this, this man Lazarus who was at his gate. He's able to recognize him although none of them had a body. So I'm submitting to you that we're going to be able to know each other for two reasons. Number one, we're going to be able to recognize each other because of the incredible faculty that God will give us and number two we're going to be able to recognize each other because there's a level of communication that none of us really recognize and it's an unseen level at the soul question number two will there be marriage in the resurrection well <laughs> Matthew 22 30 says what yes or no 22 30 at the resurrection people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. God, you see, God's primary purpose in marriage is to paint a picture of the heavenly marriage between Christ and, and the church. So, 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 will you know your spouse? Because, uh, will you know your spouse? Well, based on what we've said, you will know your spouse. Amen? But I want to tell you, when you get to heaven, your first order of business will not be to find your spouse. It will be all about the Lamb. Amen? It will be all about the one who died for our sin. When we get to heaven, we are all going to make a beeline for Jesus, the one who saved us by his grace. We're going to fall at his feet and worship him. The song, the choir used to sing a song, I just want to see him. I just want to see his face, to thank him for his grace when he comes. But you know there won't be any second honeymoon in heaven. Now, I'm sorry to burst some of you folks' bubble um, because, uh, you know, uh, you're looking forward to a new body. And you say, wow, what, what an incredible experience it is going to be to be with my wife in heaven with this amazing body. Sorry. Matthew 22, 30 says, men and, in, and women in heaven will be like the angels. You see, there, will, there won't be any sex in heaven, nor will there anybody having children. And thank God that's the case, because otherwise, you know, sometimes if, some married folks, if we're not careful, you know, we, we live a very exclusionary life. We, we want to be by ourselves, and if you don't have a, if, 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 we sometimes make those who don't have a, a spouse, don't feel that they're a part of the team. Well, I tell you, when we get to heaven, that won't be the story, amen? amen. We'll all be together. Yes, you may have a mate, and you, you know, you'll be able to enjoy, uh, the, 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 but it won't be like you're grouping off and by yourself. Muslim men who die in jihad. You know what they're promised? They're promised 72 virgins in paradise. You see, that concept is based on an earthly perspective of what pleasure is. But heaven is beyond our imagination. You see, God made sex for two purposes, uh, one for procreation, procreation, and one for pleasure. And you see, in heaven, there's not going to be any need for procreation. The reason that why, why there's need for procreation on earth is, is because God wants to perp per perpetuate the human race. And, and if people are dying and nobody is being added, after a while, what's going to happen? You're going to run out. If, if, the, if the one group is dying and nobody's being added. So, so part of what sex is about is procreation to perpetuate the human race. But in heaven, how many of you are going to die in heaven? Man, we won't die. There's going to be nobody dying in heaven. Nobody's going to be sick in heaven. What? Can you imagine? Can you wrap your little brain about that concept? That there's going to be nobody dying. Nobody's going to be get sick in heaven. Nobody's going to get old in heaven. No need to replace us. But you know, there's, we, we, don't need, we don't need the pleasure that we get from having 72 virgins in heaven. Because there's going to be unimaginable pleasure awaiting us in heaven. Uh, Psalm 16, 11 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Listen, we will be provided with bodies that can handle 
greater ecstasy than we have ever known. I wonder if you, uh, can you just say, stop and just think on that? God is going to give us a body that can appreciate greater ecstasy than we have ever known. God has designed something that's in a different league than what we have ever experienced. And that's why I believe the Bible make, say, makes, says this. I had not seen nor ear heard nor hath it entered what? The imagination. Don't, don't leave off the word imagination. Not only did he say it hasn't entered the heart of man. It said neither has it entered the imagination of the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for them who love him. And I tell you every time you, you stop to ponder that verse. And just to consider that God is saying it has not even entered anyone's imagination. You, you know there have been some people with fabulous imagination. I remember when I was a little boy. Uh, Dick Tracy. What, what did he have that used to boggle our minds? Dick Tracy had what? A, no, he did not know what. It was a two-way wrist radio. He had a watch. He never had no watch. He had a two-way wrist radio. And he could see all the action. Oh, yeah. Do you realize how much imagination it took for the person who came up with that? There was no concept of oh, having no cell phone and I can text you my picture and we can, I have FaceTime and we can see each other. You're in South America, the soccer, and you press FaceTime and I press FaceTime and we see each other. Whoa! They never had any such thing. It was an amazing... And here's what God is saying. The most creative, the most imaginative person that has ever lived, no matter what you can imagine, God is saying this human body cannot imagine what heaven is going to be like. I, I don't want you to miss that. God is saying... The human body, the mind you have, heaven is so in a different league. You cannot grasp or imagine what heaven is going to be like. And he's going to give you and me a new body that is so off the chart that I can enjoy the ecstasy of this place that is beyond my imagination. I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. How about you? Are you glad you're going to heaven? Oh, I hope you're sure you're really going. This is one thing you don't want to hope about. You want to be sure you're going to be there. But question three, what happens to the Christian who dies before the resurrection day? The believer, you know, sometimes you come to the funerals and you get the impression that this person uh, uh, is just bounding up in the streets of gold right now. He got his new body and he's walking. No, 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 no. Nobody ain't going to get to heaven and walk them streets of gold before we do. Did you know that? Did you, you didn't realize that? Nobody's going to be walking the streets of gold ahead of time. We all going to get there at the same time. Oh, I wish I had time to break it down for you. Listen, the believer who dies is alive in Christ even before the resurrection. In here in Matthew 22, verse 31 to 32, here's what Jesus said. He said, but about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living this is a reference to what God told Moses that he was God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these were alive. But, but here's, here's, what, here's, what he's, here's what he's trying to go. He's trying to say, I am God of the living, not the dead. So these men are alive. The believer who dies in Christ is always alive. But the dead believer prior to the resurrection has no body.
body. Where we get hung up is that we, we live in these bodies and we spend so much emphasis on the body that once we figure the body is not in the mix, we figure it's not worth it. This body is just simply a house for the real you, where our personality, our personality is, is stored in our soul. Our spirit is what communicates with God. And this body is all that it does. It helps me to navigate this world. But listen, the real me, when I die, I'll fly away. Amen? Yeah. Oh, I know Brother Charles is saying he's waiting for the upper taker. He's not waiting for the undertaker. He don't want to give the undertaker no business. But it's okay with me. I, I would like to wait myself. But listen, it does not matter one way or the other because what I do know is that I'm going to be with Jesus when I die. You see, when you die before the resurrection, your body is buried onto the resurrection day, but your soul and your spirit, the real you, young person, the real you, this is why when you, if you cut off a person's legs and their hands and you cut all the, the person is no less, is no less them than they ever were. Are you getting it? The body is just a case. It's the shell for the real you. And when this dies, the real you is alive. And here's what the apostle says. To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. You know. So you're saying, what's the big deal? I was going to say this, but let me say it anyhow. You said, and what's the big deal? Why do, why do, I, why do, why do I need this? Why do we need a resurrection? God has prepared a special place called heaven, a home, our real home. And you can't walk, do you know one thing I can tell you? I won't be able to walk the street of gold without a body. My soul can't walk the street of gold. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is a dimension of what God has prepared for us that cannot be realized and accomplished without a brand new body. Amen? Amen. And God is going to give us a body, yes, so that we can actually physically enjoy heaven. A body that, yes, we can eat whatever it is up there. What a day that's going to be. Oh, I, oh I, what, a, what a day. I, I hope you're looking forward to being there with him. Brother Jim told us a, a story in Bible study. A boy, I tell you, we've had some incredible Bible studies. But Brother Jim, on Tuesday nights, Brother Jim told us how, a, a good illustration. He, he was saying, you, you know, sometimes it's interesting. You watch a school bus and the school bus stops and all the children get off and they head for home. He says, you know, if you watch that school bus, nobody's usually telling the children where to go. Everybody just gets up, they come off the bus, and everybody knows where home is, amen? Everybody knows where home is, and they don't really need to knock. It's home! And I tell you, when a believer dies, nobody has to tell me where home is. When we die, we will automatically go home. And I won't have to knock on the door and ask, Oh, Jesus, can I get in? Oh, we hear all them stories about what you're going to tell Peter when you get to the gate. I won't have to meet Peter at no gate. Amen. <laughs> When I die, hallelujah, I'm going to you die if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're going to go right on home. Finally, when is the resurrection day? Oh, I know I have you in overtime. But when is the resurrection day? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 to 52. I think you still had your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So therefore you shouldn't take too long to get there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 says this. It says, uh, it says uh, I declare to you brothers that flesh and blood cannot. So what, what is the word? Flesh and blood what? Cannot. Cannot. Inherit the kingdom of God. 
nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. And this is all going to happen at what the, we, we call the rapture, when Jesus comes to snatch away his, his church. Read more about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to the end. And listen, this can happen at any moment. There's no prophecy, no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for this to happen. This, 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 this rapture where Jesus comes and snatches away the church. This rapture when the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're all going, it's all going to happen one time for those of us who know Jesus as Savior. It's going to happen in a flash. It's going to happen without warning. Friend, listen, young person, you're not going to get a chance to say, Jesus, please, I, I, I really intended to trust you. I'm trusting you now. You won't have a chance. It's going to happen too fast. It's going to be in a flash. Have you ever wondered why people refuse the resurrection, to believe in the resurrection? Matthew 22, verse 29 tells you. Jesus tells the Sadducees, you are in error. Because you do not know the scripture or the power of God. People wonder how is God going to pull it off. Some of you are sitting here right now. In fact, you might be a Christian and you're wondering, can God really pull this off? God can't pull it off. You may not be saved because you're not sure. You said, how in the world can God pull it off? I, I, I know people who when they died, they insisted that they be, be uh, what is the word, cremated. And, and some people not only get cremated, they ask that their, 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 their bodies be taken up into an airplane and a little of the ashes dropped in the Atlantic Ocean, a little dropped in the Indian Ocean, a a little dropped in the, what are the other oceans? <laughs> Pacific. I'm giving you an F in geography because you couldn't help me. And, and, and the whole thing, do you know some people actually do that because they're actually daring God to resurrect them? Now here's the funny part. You're daring a God that you say doesn't exist. You're daring a God who doesn't exist to resurrect you. What a joke. But you think that's any big deal for God? All I can tell you, I know about this Jesus because I heard a, I heard a story that one time he went by, a guy had died and he was in this place for four days. Uh, the, the people in the town said he was stinking and Jesus shows up at this grave. It's a guy by the name of Lazarus. You ever heard about that story? Jesus shows up at this man's Lazarus. He's dead four days. He's a stink as ever. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And I want you to know this dead man, he was still bound up and tied up. And I want you to know that this dead man, although he was bound and tied, this dead man, at the word of Jesus, come forth. He came forth. And I want you to know, it's no big deal. You see, we misunderstand. We underestimate the power of God. And I know, and I know that this word is unshakable. The word of God is true. And one day there is going to be a resurrection for those of us who know the Lord Jesus. My question as I close, are you sure you're going to make it? That's really the question. Are you going to make it? Do you realize if you, miss have, if you miss the first resurrection, I told you earlier, there's a second one coming. There's a second resurrection, and that's a resurrection. The Bible says it's a resurrection to damnation, where God is going to bring all those who rejected him, give them a body to be cast in the lake of fire. Oh, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. And so the word of God says, 
how shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Listen, my friend, young person, teenager, older person, you do not have to say to God today, I don't want it. All you've got to do is nothing. If you neglect God's salvation, the second resurrection is where you'll go. Choose Jesus today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, give help to that person today. That young person, that older one, who is not sure that they're going to make it to heaven. They're not sure they're going to be in the first resurrection because they're not really sure that their sins are forgiven. It could be they have even prayed a prayer before, but deep down in their heart, they have no assurance that if they die, they'd go to heaven. God, speak to that person today. Give them the courage to say yes to the Savior. My friend, our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. God is speaking to you and he's disturbing you about the fact that you're really not sure that you'll go to heaven. And the sensible thing to do is to say, Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you. I want to pray for you. I really want to pray for you. I want to, we want to do everything we can to make sure that there's nobody that's in here today that will miss heaven. There is no, listen, there is no reason why anyone in this room should miss heaven. If you miss heaven, don't blame Jesus. Because right now, he's opening his arms and he said, I died for you. I died to save you. I died to forgive you. Come to me. Would you do it right now? And if you are, I want to pray for you. Raise your hand right now. Anyone, raise your hand right now. Young person, older person. Come to Jesus right now. If you're not sure that you're on the road to heaven, you come to Jesus now. You raise your hand right now. We'll pray for you. And then give us a chance to have a personal prayer with you in a minute. Anybody like that? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. I may, you may have prayed a prayer before, but you're not really sure. Settle it now. Settle it now. Anybody like that? Anybody like that? Father, continue to speak to our hearts. And if there is that one person, that young person, that older one, who is not sure where they stand with you, make, help them to make that all-important decision. And again, Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for that you are preparing a city for us. We bless you for what's ahead. For Christ's sake, amen. Mm -hmm.